Hello and welcome back to our survey of church history, The Church's Story. We are in Lesson 7, and tonight we're going to be talking about monasticism. And that will follow our most recent lesson, which was on the rise of Islam and the Crusades. So um, now I can't remember who was here and who wasn't. But if you were here, what was, what was striking to you or interesting about the rise of Islam? It hmm. swept quickly. Quickly, yeah. The the um, conquering like really moved fast um, through the you know kind of the Roman world and and more than the Roman world. Yeah, and then it was as much of a political a political conquering as a religious conquering. They used the they used the sword that like the quote you know it can't be from God if it if it requires a sword. Interesting. Well, that idea. So these were kind of it was kind of set up as theocracies, which, you know, to be fair, everywhere was, you know, there was no such thing as separation of church and state. So like it went from a pagan Roman government to a Christian Roman government. But all those governments had a religion. Those were joined together. The separation of those didn't come later. So, yes, it was a it was a kind of a joint political and um, religious as things are, and when it swept through um, a lot of area. Yeah. What else? <clears throat> what about the Crusades? I think that I realized they went on as long as they did. Yeah. Okay, so that that time period, um, we're going to talk a little bit, we're going to talk a little timeline tonight, but that time period from um, 1096 to 1296, like 200 full years of multiple crusades. Yeah, not just one event, but multiple events. Yeah. And I don't think I realized that they um, took Jerusalem for a time. The, the Crusades? The, yeah, that the Christians got it back and then lost it again. Yes, and then lost it again. Yeah. So, you know, the um, one of the interesting things about um, Islam is its relationship to Christianity and that idea that um, at its foundation, they kind of started with some of the same things. Some of those, the religious practices are very similar. Um, and it, an idea of God without the Trinity is very similar to the, the, the Islamic idea of God. And so that um, has a relationship there. And one of the elements that enabled Islam to spread as fast as it did was sort of the singularity of its creed and how it was simple. And we think about that in relationship to Christianity because Christianity is not simple. Our understanding of God is uh, mysterious and we sometimes are frustrated with that ourselves sometimes that is a stumbling block or a difficulty and yet the beauty of the love of the relationship between the persons of the trinity and how um, Christianity is, the idea of Christianity is joining that relationship and so it's it's rich but it's not simple and then on the Crusades, we talked about, um, you know, there, there were some good motivations, and yet there was a, a absolute failure of any of the primary goals. So the idea of retaking the Holy Land, by the time that period is over, that 200-year period is over, none of that remains under Christian control, none of the Holy Land. And the idea of... Um, Mending fences, join, you know, having a restored relationship between the Western Church and the Eastern Church, and how really it just exploded the um, conflict between them um, and solidified that schism. So, those are, you know, kind of takeaways from that um, lesson and those two pieces that related to each other. Any questions or comments on that? Okay, well, um, we, because of, you know, we did some, we've, we were progressing through time and then we stepped back to do the rise of Islam and kind of move forward into the Crusades. And so we've been sort of 
uh, all over the, the timeline a little bit. And tonight we're going to be all over the timeline again because monasticism is an influence in the church that spans sort of the life of the church from the, the early church to the medieval period. And because of that, I thought what I would do is um, do just a little bit of timeline um, uh, review. And um, I'm going to try to open the whiteboard. Did that open for you? Nope. nope. Let me try again. I don't know. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing. I saw a monk in Austria. There was a monastery right outside the town we were visiting. Okay. You know, there are still monasteries even, you know, stateside today. Um, share screen. Ah, oh, this is how I just do it in share screen. See, I could have tell, checked that before. So I'm going to paste a, a timeline up here so we can refer to it. But this is in, if you, you know, if you want it, this is all written down in your handout. So it would be, you know, easy for you to refer to. Okay, can everyone see this? All right. In um, the the periods that we've gone through, we talked quite a bit about that earliest Christianity section, that um, New Testament period to 311 when we had the Edict of Toleration. So we had our three lessons about that. And then when we did the Council of Nicaea and so on, we were in this period of the seven ecumenical councils. And this takes us through the 700s. Embedded in this time are two major sort of um, events that are progressing. And one is the changes in the Western Roman Empire. So in the 400s, you know, the, the Roman Empire has been in decline since 180. Things got really serious right around 300. That was the prompt, the reason that prompted the great persecution. And then they thought, let's unify the Roman Empire by persecuting Christians was it's kind of an oversimplified version of that. And then there was a kind of a reversal of it where you had the effect after Constantine converted, whether um, genuinely or not, to Christianity, you had the effect of maybe unifying the, the Western Roman Empire in Christianity. And so that's been going on, and yet things have still been falling apart. And in come these Germanic tribes. So we have the Vandals, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths. And this, these are like warring people that are around the edges, and they're coming in. They've had border skirmishes for years, but by the 400s, things are just falling. And so the Western Empire um, falls uh, in 410, Rome is sacked, and then by 476, the last Roman Empire. Empire, emperor is deposed. Then, so, you know, we have that decline. Then um, in 570, we have the birth of Muhammad. 622 is where the, the, the expansion of Islam begins. And um, it, it in just 100 years, 110 to be exact, it spreads through much of the, the Roman world. Um, and is only stopped in what is uh, modern day France in Gaul uh, by Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours. And so that's happening at the same time as these, this period of the ecumenical councils. Well, over that time, you also have, even though the Germanic tribes came in and, and the West fell, over time, those tribes are being converted to Christianity, and you're getting more of a rise again of kind of a reborn, they thought of themselves, maybe, as kind of a reborn Roman Empire. So that by the year 800, Charlemagne, who is the grandson of Charles Martel, is crowned Holy Roman Emperor. It's kind of a you know, it, it's, is the continuity in the empire really there? Maybe not necessarily, but it's they it's more like a rebirth by the Pope at the time, Pope Leo the Third, and then by in the thousand, you know, we have the schism of the Church and the beginning of the Crusades, and this period, you know, this is the medieval period that will take us to next week's or in two weeks next lessons topic of the protestant reformation 
Well, when we think about our lesson about the Crusades and when we look at this timeline, doesn't the church look very different in year, say, 1000 than it looked in maybe four or 500? The church has changed so much, hasn't it? There's been an expansion in wealth and power, right? Why, why is there a Pope? Why is there, why is there someone who can crown a Holy Roman Emperor? What is the, um, you know, we talked about indulgences being offered for um, crusaders. Well, when did that come about? How is their indulgence? What is this expansive doctrine? And so we see there's a big shift in that, admittedly, you know, long period, several hundred years. So any ideas, what, what are the major things that changed to create that difference? It was like Christianity suddenly became a political movement also. <laughs> okay. So that's, that is a great way to look at it because with Constantine, you have the persecuted minority suddenly becoming the sponsored majority. And from there, that shift really continues. So this, that's the beginning of what we would call a path to Christendom the Christian empire that spanned the once Roman world and influenced and increasingly dominated countries for century to come. That begins at Constantine, it continues through the medieval period. Well, one of the major factors that we have is the development of the Roman papacy. So when you go from, when you think about the letters that we read, like one bishop is writing to another versus suddenly there's a Pope. Well, how did that happen? And it turns out that this did not happen at all at once. It wasn't suddenly there's a Pope, but it was a gradual shift over time. You remember in those early periods, there were a, a plurality of elders who were also called bishops. Those terms were used interchangeably. We talked about that at the beginning, but over the time that there was that persecution, um, they needed organization, they needed protection of doctrine, and it shifted to there being one bishop over, as a leader, over a group of elders in a congregation. The direction of that continues further still, where um, over time there is one bishop over the congregations in the city so that the church in Rome has a bishop, the church in Ephesus has a bishop, and so on. And bishops were often called papas, the colloquial word for father. And thus any bishop might be the word that we now, you know, uh, use as pope, right? That papas. Well, over time, church organization became more hierarchical, more organized, as you had the fall of the many cities, you needed a stronger and more organized church presence because you don't have the, you know, you have failing government presence. And it became that there were five leading bishops called patriarchs over five prominent cities. And those cities were Rome. Okay. We expect that in Rome is in the West and then Constantinople, Antioch, Alexandria in Northern Africa and Jerusalem. Well, these other four are all in what became the East. We talked about how the Byzantine Empire was really just the Eastern Roman Empire that continued to be the Roman Empire when the West fell. So in the Byzantine Empire, they have four patriarchs and in the West, there's just Rome. In some circles, especially in the West, where Rome was the only city with a patriarch, the, the Bishop of Rome is given extra honor as the successor of Peter. You remember that Peter was said to have been martyred in Rome as a kind of first among equals. Well, what happens when you have a first among equals? There's often a power struggle to have a first above the others, right? And that is part of what happens next. So with the fall of the Roman Empire, the authority that was given that the church 
took or was given to them to try to maintain social order, the Roman patriarch began to claim authority of the others. Now the others, you know, are in the East, they're also, they're doing some of the same kind of behavior. They're also claiming supremacy. The Bishop of Constantinople, Constantinople in particular was like, actually, I should be the head of this whole thing, right? I'm, this is the city where we have the you know, the emperor, when we had Constantine, was let's, I should be in charge. And so there's squabbles back and forth. This is part of what contributed to the East-West schism of the church. And when the East-West church split, partly over these power struggles, all four of the Eastern patriarchs are on one side, the West is left only with Rome. So then it becomes clear who's in charge. It's the Patriarch of Rome. And then we have what we would think of now as a Pope. The Roman Catholic Church, as we know it now, looks back and calls every Bishop of Rome, going all the way back to Peter, a Pope. And so it, if we're looking historically and thinking about the papacy as we think of it, it's hard to even decide, well, when was the first Pope? They call them all popes, but we don't, it doesn't it doesn't really fit the model that we're thinking of when we think of a pope. And so, who was the first pope? One um, candidate is Leo the first in four thirty, but definitely by Gregory the first in five ninety, who Doctor Stanglin will mention in the video. We've got what we would call the papacy. So we have that shift and that really, you know, the growth of hierarchy that really changes the culture in the, the Western church. Questions or comments on that? It's interesting how gradual it is and yet um, it really makes a difference. You know, we, what we think of as the papacy is a huge factor when we get into the medieval period. Mm -hmm. Um, where does the, like the Eastern Orthodox Church as it stands now, I mean, are they still the Eastern Church, the Byzantine Empire, basically? Yes. Yeah. So um, the schism um, in 1054 is uh, the what was on the East was the whole Eastern Orthodox Church, and they will have um, named churches that are in communion with one another. So like maybe there's a Greek Orthodox and the Russian Orthodox. These are um, sort of like uh, state churches, but they're all considered part of the Eastern Orthodox Church. They're all, um, they're, they all follow the same sort of overarching theology and are in communion with one another. Whereas the Western church and the Eastern church were not in communion with one another. Each, they anathematized each other. Now they have, in the modern era, they have removed those anathemas, but there are still practical and theological differences between them that, you know, because they grew apart. Mm -hmm. I know they're Easter's at a different time, so. Yeah, um, you remember the Easter was a kind of a sticking point through early church history. And even in the uh, first council, the first ecumenical council at Nicaea, they decided, oh, we'll start having Easter at this time. But Easter was also always um, this Sunday rather than the 14th of Nisan was what was decided. And both, both um, Eastern church and Western church recognize those seven ecumenical councils and they have gone to Sunday as well, but they're determined, uh, the Jewish pattern of determining Passover was by the moon. These mm -hmm. are lunar um, date selections. And so the way that that date was determined was it became different in the East and the West. Yeah. Anything else about that? Well, the other major factor um, was the rise of some European dynasties. Um, I mentioned uh, Charlemagne, 
And that, so the Saxons are one, and then the Carolingian dynasty, which is Charles Martel, his son, and then his grandson, Charlemagne. This is a major factor. These um, were, the Franks were actually a Germanic tribe, but they're in Gaul, modern day France. They emerged in Europe in the 200s, and then um, they just, they got stronger and stronger. They conquered more and more territory over these some centuries, and they spread Christianity, so that by the time you know we get to Charlemagne, the Pope is anointing him. You know they're the they're teamed up, and the power of one and the kind of the. Uh, well, I guess power of the other, you know, uh, uh, military power and the power of the church and that teaming up was a, a way that all of Europe was sort of um, under the government of the two jointly in the way that they fit together. That dynasty led to a Carolingian renaissance with increased learning trade and religious scholarship in those early years from 800 and into into the you know thousand so the, those major factors are are why we get such a different church in a thousand than we had in four or five hundred questions or comments all right this is you know this existence of the strong church hierarchy and it's partnering with these strong national monarchies allowed the expansion of really three things in this period. Theological complexity, that's how we get penance, indulgences, things like that, church power and wealth, and formal liturgy. And those are the major factors that make the church different. And we can see that over time, um, individual Christians, devout Christians might look at some of that expansion and have a resistance to it or a reaction against it. Uh, when the church looks like the, the power in the world, does that look like Jesus in his world? And so take, you know, keep that sort of vision in mind. And Dr. Stanglin will talk about how that's a factor in monasticism. So if you're watching this after the fact, now is the time to go to the Center for Christian Studies website, log in using our class account, and watch video module eight on monasticism. Okay, so we are back from watching our video on the history and impact of monasticism. So um, any overall impression, initial impressions, um, questions or thoughts you had on that? Lots of different orders. Yeah, yeah, oh, because, you know, we're going from so over so many centuries, you know, kind of mm -hmm. a, he traced about, about a thousand years. Yeah. Um, when did the yeah, Jesuits and, come in? Just out of curiosity. Oh, that is a good question. I think they're after the Dominicans, but okay. I don't, I'm not sure about that. Okay. I would have to look that up. My philosophy professor in college was a Jesuit. Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, good point in that um, many of these orders remain today and still are active. Yeah. So what about the motivation? Why, why, what did you hear about why people would enter the life of a monk, monk or a nun or a hermitess? Any of that category? To get away from the world to, uh, and to get away from the corruption in the church, which is of course there because there are sinners in the church and um, to focus their, their life on um, the spiritual, side of things sorry yeah. i thought yeah. it was Other thoughts? interesting that they some of them entered hey scarlet to be because they um weren't being persecuted anymore yeah, to mute. and that was how they were persecuted i didn't miss that that's what he said right there was kind of their modern more modern way of being persecuted and well, it was uh, not not being persecuted, but yes, but 
your point stands taking up their cross some way of denial of self some some a more of a path of asceticism a vow of poverty some some way of um training the spirit through uh self-control and self-denial that um maybe wasn't available if you were just living life in the worldly church yeah you also heard that um, there was more opportunities for women to be educated, to become theologians and writers, advisors to high level, um, high level um, people in the church, um, in the these opportunities and opportunities to serve people. Um, the, the monasteries very often function as the only education in small communities or um, the only uh, clinics medical clinics in an area and so they did all sorts of things they would grow crops be brew beer uh, bakeries like they did all sorts of things where they functioned um, in a way that was very beneficial for their community so there was a draw towards joining that as well um, we talked about, uh, he talked about scripture and how they did a lot of scribal work. And this was, this was true all the way through the years up to, um, the printing press, which will become a factor by the time the Protestant Reformation. So we'll, that will come up in our next lesson, but this is all pre printing press. And so the scribal work, um, education, healthcare, uh, and charity and mission work. Yeah. I didn't realize that they were so missionary oriented. It depends on the order, but yeah. Yeah. You never so, think of like the monks as they're, they're more secluded and not, not missionaries going out. Yeah. Especially as the uh, monasticism kind of comes out of that hermitage area, and yet um, as these different orders proliferated, different ones had different focus, and those were the missionaries that went to multiple different areas. 70, 70 different houses. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what else? What else comes to mind about uh, monasteries or monasticism? I think the, oh, go ahead, Aaron, you were going to say? I was just thinking about, you know, I didn't realize that the bishops passed down their titles like the priests did in the in Jewish tradition and that they passed down their wealth and their titles and that it was a They weren't back. supposed to. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that wasn't um, the established you know, it wasn't supposed to happen. So, you know, we talked about early on bishops, priests, you know, there weren't having um, a celibate priesthood is a, something that develops in that period where I said, you know, the development of theological complexity and liturgy that happens in that period. But early on, you have bishops, you know, the next bishop would be chosen for their maturity and their, you know, Christ-likeness. And then as co corruption increases, you have more and more instances where it's not that's not what's happening. And in fact, simony, which is the um, abuse of church practice, practice by buying a, um, a an office, a church office, um, is uh, one of the major uh, elements of church corruption that becomes a problem when you get, to, by the time you get to the Protestant Reformation. So that sort of thing, bishops even, you know, having um, sexual relationships is an abuse and then these children out of wedlock is an abuse and then passing their offices down to them is an abuse so you have kind of a proliferation of the problems and I think we can fairly say that while there there are um, genuine and devout uh, priests and members of the church hierarchy at every age, that the level of the corruption is increasing across this period to the point that it becomes, um, you know, an explosive situation by the time we get to the Protestant Reformation.
It's interesting, corruption caused by power has always and will always be the same. Yeah, yeah. And so it's sad that it's in the church, but on the other hand, it's not so surprising that it's in the church because of the power, the wealth, the partnership with those monarchies, the way that that developed Christendom, as you know, we might call it. And that's why um, we might sometimes look back and say, even though those early persecuted Christians were so thankful for the end of persecution, that reversal that resulted in the end of their persecution sort of put us on a path to where um, it, the church took on a very different character. Yeah. All right, anything else? Next week, we are off for spring break. So um, we will not be meeting at all next week, um, but the following week, we'll be um, addressing the Protestant Reformation uh, and the other sort of reformations of the 16th century, which were in some ways sort of answers to the Protestant Reformation, counter Reformation. Um, or, and sometimes we might call the Protestant Reformation um, uh, it, multiples, Protestant Reformations, because it wasn't just one thing. There were multiple things happening because the situation had come to a head we get reformers um, popping up in multiple places so that the whole thing is sort of a, a multifaceted movement. And we'll talk about that and just the idea of reformation and um, why it happened in general. And some of those factors are um, the whole the whole historical situation of like the Renaissance and how that fits in. So that will be our lesson next time. Very exciting. Um, and uh, that's it. Thank you for being here and I will stop the recording and we can do our prayer requests. <laughs>